United States was certainly in need of such public relations as social science could provide. Or as Robinson explains, since racial regimes are, quote, actually contrivances that tend to wear thin over time, designed and delegated by interested cultural and social powers with the wherewithal sufficient to commission their imaginings, manufacture, and maintenance, this latter industry, in this case of social science, was of some singular importance, end quote. These propagandists put forward national manhood, white quality of life, the Negro, the savage, liberal paternalism, American empire, and American exceptionalism, behaviorism, charisma, pluralist democracy, electoral politics, on and on, mass media studies, opinion surveys, immigration restriction, and anti-blackness in its most comprehensive sense in response to decolonization domestically and in the world system. As they emerged in the eugenics era as formal academic disciplines resting on the funding of industrial capitalist turned state benefactors, they orchestrated political, cultural, and ideological purges of radicals in this society. And they recruited a domestic black leadership seriously engaged in a project of disciplining black liberation movements through the disavowal of W.E.B. Du Bois and so many others. As our own Ralph Bunch, and I say our own, you know, um, because of his prominence in the UC system, as our own Ralph Bunch illustrated how best to do this, quote, nor was there any dictatorship of the black proletariat in the Reconstruction period, as Du Bois suggests in his Black Reconstruction. The newly freed black had no working class consciousness, in fact, no class consciousness at all. His psychology, even after emancipation, was that of the serf, or best, the peasant, end quote. When in 1940, Bunch wrote this as a research addendum to Gunnar Myrdal's historic American Dilemma study of race relations in the United States, he was profoundly and intimately drawn into the future of propagandist American political science. It was not enough to whisper condemnations about black radicals by calling them unpatriotic and against capitalism. Indeed, it was far more officious to discipline the black liberation struggle through recapitulating it into histories of naturalized slavery. Thus, when Cedric Robinson takes up the question of black abolitionist political campaigns, he is not posing a thin celebrationist rebuttal to the nature of slavery. Rather, he is rebutting the history of the natural slave that has come to so profoundly cohere with and constitute blackness. In response to this tying of blackness to the figure of the slave, Robinson explains that, quote, anti-black racism, then, is a tool to legitimate decisive transformations in power relations, not a universally inherent code of belief, end quote. When Bunch further wrote, there was no political activity of any consequence in the antebellum period among black people he's talking about, for restrictions against even the free Negro were widespread. Early black political leadership was confined primarily to that expressed through scattered slave revolts and to that of free Negroes whose burdens were great and who feared that they would be pushed down to the level of slaves, end quote. Bunch was reflecting a long politics of black political accommodation, masquerade, and achievement of mastery of the aforementioned propaganda of technocratic rule. How else might a black political scientist write about the brutality of the convict lease system, debt peonage, lynching, and other forms of public sexual humiliation, and all the dimensions of Jim Crow under the liberalism of the Roosevelt era? How else might a political scientist write about the singular betrayals of the internationalist communist movement, which profoundly trafficked in what Dan McClure has called the symbolic value of blackness? Writing against these terms of order and their conceit, Cedric Robinson turns his attention to communal, collective, stateless, social order, commandeered by Marxist science and Marxist fascination with historical role of the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. For Robinson, there was no need to shoehorn the radical action of black tenant farmers or black domestic workers or the decolonized black radical intelligentsia into the guise of proletarians or loyal citizens. But there was also no need to disavow black people's consciousness as historical agents or workers. I think probably some of you may have seen the story that's circulating right now. It's like sort of viral. Um, and it's just a reprint from Leon Litwack. It's uh, 
a story uh, based on a letter written by Jordan Anderson from August 7th, 1865, who had been able to escape from slavery and move to Dayton, Ohio. And his old master, Colonel P. Anderson of Big Spring, Tennessee, was contacting him to try to find out if he could get him to come back and work. And what's lovely about the letters, um, Anderson relays that he would consider returning to work if the colonel would acknowledge his freedom, which had already been gained and certified through Provost Marshal General of the Department of Nashville in 1864, and if he would provide back pay for himself and his wife for 25 years of labor and safety from sexual abuse for his daughters, because as he wrote, you know what happened to those other young ladies on the plantation. When Robinson instructs that, quote, the ra racial protocols were contested and subject to deterioration, he is explaining that the Black Liberation Project, with its, quote, sheer volume and plurivocality of anti-racism resistance, has set the stage for later oppositions. It does not require us to repeat the sort of accommodations that Bunch made. Through the astute methodology of tracing the making of the natural racial slave, the cornerstone of the hierarchy of legitimate force passing as democracy, through the many narratives of origin which the US variant of white nationalism claims, Robinson clears the ground for new thinking, reminding us of the, quote, pre-capitalist history of racism within the West and the pre-Marxian socialist discourses. Robinson can then make plain the significance of the dedicated and committed rebuilding of autonomous, leaderless, horizontal communities where ego is defined as we, where, quote, humanity is indivisible from the collective relation, where the whole personality, I'm quoting here, the whole personality is consistently understood as a construct immersed in, dependent upon, and consequent to the social integration of community where excellence is defined as, quote, the occasion of a profound cumulative expression. These articulations of socialisms and the sustained scholarly courage that participates in and documents them make exceedingly plain that socialist thought did not begin with or depend on the existence of capitalism. In another moment, Robinson took up, and this is anthropology now, of Marxism, Robinson took up the question by painstakingly identifying the ways in which Marxism is not a break with the bourgeois state. It is not the genuine voice of the oppressed. It is not a science of capitalism, ultimately. It is not an explanation of the emergence of socialism, and it fails to live up to the claim of being the ultimate opponent to the capitalist world system. Marxian secularism and Marxian racism cut off the long and storied criticisms of power, property, and poverty that existed before the bourgeois state. Marxian theory argued instead that the critique of power, property, and poverty only arose as the result of, quote, historical laws, personal and class ambitions, end quote, instead of as the result of divine agency, or as Avery Gordon explains it, our sovereign and creative divinity, that is our spirited consciousness and our own proven ability to remake the conditions and history in which we live, end quote. This is more than agency, but quite distinct from achieved sovereignty upon which Dr. De Silva railed so successfully last quarter. This kind of consciousness is divine because of its reproductive capacity and willingness to embrace and make heresy, because of its rejection of messiahs and because of its test of theoretical and ethical ad adequacy is the history of power and resistance to its abuses. This discussion of spirited consciousness takes us much closer to Jackie Alexander's examination of spirit work and spiritual accompaniment, which is defined as the labor of communing with the history of enslavement and forced migration of populations being reduced to mere people of the body. And the divine value self-ascribed and ancestor ascribed by these same people who were dragged into the groundworks of modernity. As the celebration of Robinson's contribution to the black radical tradition at UCSB in 2000, was it five?
for 2004 attested, this body of work has become an anchoring genealogy and methodology across the disciplines. As his later books take up the question of racial regimes in popular and mass culture, theatrical performances, films, political cartoons, <coughs> and cinema, uh, Professor Robinson has mentored uh, an incredibly large and diverse number of students, including um, consistent cohorts of women of color, of which I'm one. Um, He's been the founding director for the Center of Black Studies at UC Santa Barbara with sort of the mind frame that the best way to animate black studies is to engage people as researchers. Let them have access to this history because of what it offers us, you know. He has been the chair of political science, the chair of black studies at UC Santa Barbara, and um, has contributed to four decades of alternative media with the express intention of producing an anti-imperialist rendering of global affairs. Um, and there's a lot of archival work. I've been trying to recruit students actually for looking at Third World News Review and some of the other, um, I mean this is decades and decades of uh, political communication kind of analysis. Um, at any rate, I will end there. And please join me in uh, welcoming Professor Cedric Robinson.